my task that I was given to talk to this morning was to talk a little bit about some Canadian military history up to 1939. Um, and I, I'm going to try and make the argument that up until the start of the 20th century, uh, our military involvement, Canadian military involvement, was almost exclusively in North America. After 1900, though, our military involvement is primarily outside of North America. Well, we still have commitments here in, in Canada and things like domestic operations and fighting floods or fires, those other sorts of things. But in terms of combat operations, we've been essentially outside uh, North America. This overseas deployment has helped as a catalyst to move Canada as well as the other self-governing dominions of the time, Australia, New Zealand, Newfoundland, etc from a self-governing dominion within the British Empire to a fully independent member of the Commonwealth. So our success on the battlefield, and by success I'm talking about the success of Canadian troops, helps move the British from empire to a Commonwealth status. Now for the purpose of, the, of today's discussion, I'm gonna talk about the participation of military units raised in Canada consisting of individuals resident in Canada. So while in a lot of this time frame we have both French and British imperial troops here, I'm not really going to refer to them. So let us go back into the 17th century along the banks of the St. Lawrence in the colony of New France. Prior to 1690, most of the troops were provided by France. However, there's a logistics problem and a financial problem continuing to send troops from France to uh, New France. So starting in 19, or 1690, many of the uh, French troops, or many of the troops become members of, uh, of Canadian volunteers raised here in Canada. Um, and by the, by the 1720s, the Canadians developed, dominated the military service here in Canada, primarily consisting of habitat militia rather than actual soldiers. The residents of New France were experts at forging alliances with the native people. And with the help of their indigenous allies, they adopted what was called la petite guerre, essentially a small-scale guerrilla warfare. This style of warfare was well suited to uh, North America, the wilderness, but it allowed New France to provide, even though they were at a significant numerical disadvantage to the British and the American colonies, to effectively retaliate against their enemies. Again, predominantly the British and, their, and the American colonists. This role, however, of course, did not prevent New France from being conquered by Britain in 1760. We think perhaps of the defeat of uh, Montcalm on the Plains of Abraham in 1759 as being the most important portion perhaps of that, but really the victory of Britain in the Seven Years' War in North America, or the French and Indian War as it was known here in, in North America, uh, was the result of the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy defeated the French Navy in the Battle of Quir Quiberon Bay in November 1759. So that essentially prevents the French Navy from reinforcing New France in the spring of 1760. So Britain is able to re, uh, reinforce its troops and to defeat the balance of the F New France forces, which still at that time uh, held Montreal. So essentially in that time, Britain is now the dominant naval power for the next 150 years uh, following that victory. The next major conflict, of course, that is, occurs in North America is the American Revolution. And from Canada's perspective, as Canada is now a colony of Britain, there's very little involvement. The Americans try to capture Quebec City in 1775. They're defeated. The militia help defend Quebec City. But other than that, Basically, the Canadians stay neutral, favoring neither the French or neither the Americans nor the British during the American Revolution. What the American Revolution does, though, is brings all kinds of United Empire loyalists to Canada. Uh, the bulk of those actually go to about 33,000 go to what was then Nova Scotia, 
uh, which included New Brunswick as we know it today. Prince Edward Island got 2,000. And about 10,000 come into the colony of Canada in the eastern townships of what is now Quebec and into what we now consider southern Ontario. Not to be ignored at this time, also thousands of Iroquois and other indigenous pro-British tribes also come into Canada, leave the United States, and or are expelled from the United States. This, of course, leads with the number of English-speaking residents in the province of Canada, or in the colony of Canada, rather, is the creation of two colonies, Upper Canada, or what we would today, con today consider Quebec, and Lower Canada, or Southern Ontario. The next time we get into a dispute with the Americans is the War of 1812. So units are now raised in Canada to, to support the British Army in, in, during its various battles with the Americans. There's about three or four different types. They have what is called fencible infantry. These are temporary units commanded by British officers made up of local recruits, but which form part of the British Army. They're essentially, their intent was to be provided to, or confined to garrisons and patrol duties to free up the British units to perform offensive operations. These units were liable for service only in North America. Some examples, the Royal Newfoundland Fencibles. Remember, Newfoundland is not part of Canada at this time. Many of these regiments' soldiers were excellent boatmen, so they served as Marines on the Great Lake. One of the notable ones was the New Brunswick Regiment of Fencible Infantry. They eventually become part of the British Army as the 104th Foot in uh, 1910. However, they just served in North America, even though they could have served outside North America before being disbanded in uh, 1817. One of their uh, epic marches is they marched from Fredericton to Kingston in early 19, or 19, 1813. So if you can imagine walking on foot from Fredericton to Kingston in the dead of winter, uh, it, I'm sure it was not a very pleasant experience. They would then fight in various battles, such as <coughs> Sackett's Harbor and on the Niagara Peninsula. The French-Canadian, there was a, a unit of fencible infantry raised in, in Quebec. Uh, they fought at Chrysler's Farm, and some served as Marines again on, on, on Lake Champlain, which of course is now part of the United States. The Glengarry Light Infantry recruited from settlement of discharged uh, Scottish soldiers and some evicted Scottish Highlanders in the Glengarry District, which is uh, along the St. Lawrence uh, towards the current border with Quebec. Uh, companies and detachments fought in several actions in Upper Canada and uh, in the Battle of Lundy's Lane. I particularly, uh, the Glengarry Light Infantry is perpetuated by the Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry Highlanders, which is a reserve arm infantry unit based in Cornwall, Ontario. And I'm familiar with it because my stepson just took command of that unit in, uh, in September. There were also full-time militia units uh, established at this time, uh, formed from members of the volunteer uh, militia, or the reserves, usually intended for garrison duty only. Uh, several units saw action. Uh, the Canadian Voltigeurs, my French isn't very good this morning, formed from volunteers from the militia by Lieutenant Colonel Charles de Salisbury in 1812. Even though it was a French-Canadian unit, the uh, orders were given in English. They fought in several actions, but the most important one was the Battle of the Chateau Gay, where a force consisting of just over 1,600 regular volunteers and militia uh, and Mohawk warriors, commanded by de Salisbury, repelled an American force of almost 4,000, attempting to invade Lower Canada and attack Montreal. The Battle of Chateauguay was one of the two battles, the other being the Battle of Chrysler's Farm, which is again along the St. Lawrence, which caused the Americans to abandon the St. Lawrence campaign, their me major strategic effort in the autumn of 1813. There was also an incorporated militia battalion formed from volunteer units seeing action on the Niagara Peninsula. <coughs> 
There were also a number of part-time militia units that uh, were involved in Lower Canada. In theory, there were 54,000 men available for service in the militia. Each parish was tasked to provide one company. Except in the case of one or two units raised in Quebec and Montreal, uh, the militiamen and junior officers generally wore their own uh, clothing. Many had to use their own hunting weapons. Uh, however, during the war, the British did bring in a large number of, of muskets to provide to the militia. In Upper Canada, or Ontario, militia were organized into regiments based upon uh, each county. Normally, they would meet once a year and receive some military training, again, often wear their own clo clothing and being armed with uh, their own personal weapons. It's also too important to remember that in this war, a major role was played by the Indian Department. The Indian Department consisted of about 100 officers whose purpose was to act as agents, envoys, and interpreters to the various native bands and tribes. Uh, and a number of indigenous tribes participated in the War of 1812, all the way from, for example, uh, Lundy's Lane and a number of, of, of the battles. This would probably, the War of 1812 is probably the last time that indigenous Canadian units would serve as an organized unit or band under essentially their own leadership. From after this time, while many indigenous soldiers would serve in future wars, for example, 4,000 are estimated to have served in the First World War, they do so as part of a Canadian unit rather than a distinct indigenous unit. So after the War of 1812, all the militia units are, disp are not disbanded. They revert to being on a part-time basis. Militia units would then see some action in a couple of occasions. The Fenian Raids. Are you familiar with the Fenian Raids? The Irish. First campaign medal issued by the newly constituted country of Canada. Exactly. So it's an Irish organization, Republican organization, formed in the United States in uh, 1858. After the American Civil War, which ends in 1865, Quantities of arms were available, uh, they acquired them, and they made preparations to raid Canada. The purpose of these raids was to seize the various parts of Canada, our transportation network, etc., and then trade it to the British for the freedom of Ireland. Uh, raids occurred from 1866 to 1871 in New Brunswick, Quebec, Ontario, and the last one was in Manitoba. Um, the Canadian militia didn't fare very well in those actions. There were still British Army units in, in available and helped defeat some of the ones, particularly in, uh, in the Maritimes, in New Brunswick and Quebec. However, uh, these ended when the United States decided that, hang on, we have a Neutrality Act, we're going to enforce it, we're not going to allow uh, uh, these additional raids. The other one in which a major involvement was, militia involvement, was the Wolseley Ex Ex expedition of 1870. So a force of a thousand men traveled across northern Ontario to Fort Geary on the Red River in Manitoba as a result of the first Riel Rebellion. Notable not for any battles fought because they did not involve any battles, but rather success at traveling cross country through difficult terrain. For any of you who have driven from Winnipeg to Ontario, along north of the Great Lakes, you can imagine trying to tra traverse that country on foot and by boat and canoe. Very difficult task to do. In 1871, Britain signs the Treaty of Washington with the United States. That, in many ways, resolves the bulk of the differences that Britain had with the United States. It allows Britain to downsize their garrisons in Canada and withdraw them to other parts of the empire. So Canada is left in the difficult position of losing its permanent protection, if you want to call it that, and having to fend for ourselves. So in 1871, the first permanent active militia is established. Now that is the name that the Canadian Army will be called until 1940, when it becomes the Canadian Army. 
The first units are two batteries of artillery, one in uh, Kingston and the other Quebec City in 1871, with a third battery formed in 1887 in Esquimalt. For those of you who have some knowledge of the Canadian military, those batteries are now considered part of the first Canadian regiment, the first regiment of the Royal Canadian Horse Artillery. We also form in December uh, 1883, rather an inf infantry corps school, which will become the Royal Canadian Regiment, and a cavalry corps school, which will become the Royal Canadian Dragoons. 1885, the Northwest Rebellion, in primarily in what is now Saskatchewan. It is the first time that Canadian units participate in a campaign without any British Army support. The Canadian military, or the Canadian militia, is still commanded by a British officer, uh, Major General uh, Frederick Middleton. But however, all the troops that participate are all either the small regular army, units raised from the non-permanent active militia, which is the reserve force, the Northwest Mounted Police, and some volunteer units that are raised in places like Calgary, Edmonton, Lethbridge, etc. So as I mentioned, up to about this time, the Canadian military activities have been focused in North America. We now start to become more involved outside of North America. So in 1884, Britain for the first time asked Canada for aid in defending the empire requesting experienced boatmen to help rescue Major General Charles Gordon in the Sudan. Your old stomping grounds, Alex. Um, the government was reluctant to comply, and I guess the government of 1884 is not much different than the government of today. But eventually the Governor General uh, recruited a private force of 386 voyageurs, placed under the command of some Canadian militia officers who went uh, into the Sudan. Known as the Nile Voyageurs, they served in the, in the Sudan and became the first Canadian force to serve abroad. Sixteen Voyageurs died during that campaign. Our next major involvement outside North America is the Second Boer War, uh, 1899 to 2002. What did I say? Oh, I, it's the Second Boer War. There was another Boer War that ha happened uh, about 15 years previously. So Britain asked for Canadians' help, as they did from Australia and New Zealand as well. Um, English Canada kind of supported that concept. French Canada did not, and, uh, which has been a, an issue uh, ever, since. ever since, perhaps. But initially, we sent 1,000 soldiers in the 2nd Special Service Battalion of the Royal Canadian Regiment of Infantry. So two RCR in our current terminology. Other contingents we went later, um, including uh, uh, the privately raised Strathcona's Horse. So the Strathcona's Horse were one of the last regiments in the British Empire to be raised by a private individual. Donald Alexander Smith, the first Baron of Strathcona and Mount Royal. Smith was very influential in both in the Hudson Bay Company and in the Canadian Pacific Railroad, and that's where he made his money. His first commanding officer was a gentleman named Sam Steele, who has a very interesting history in this time frame, uh, in the post-Confederation time frame period. He joins the militia during the Fenian Raids, he served in the Red River Expedition of 1870. He joined the regular artillery in 1871. He joined the Northwest Mounted Police in 1873 and was part of the March West with the Mounted Police. He sees service again in the Northwest Rebellion of 1885 with the Mounted Police. He was in charge of policing uh, the Yukon during the Gold Rush. He then joins the army and commands the Strathcona's horse in South Africa. After the war, he returned to South Africa to serve with the South African Constabulary. He came back to Canada in 1907, serving in the army, commanding military districts. He eventually serves in an administrative role as a major general in the First World War and will die in 
1918 as, as a result of the Spanish flu epidemic. Other Canadian units also saw service in the, in the war, uh, the artillery, the Royal Canadian Dragoons. About 7,500 Canadians, including some female nurses, served in South Africa. Of these, 224 died and 252 were wounded. So after the Boer War, the army restructures, realizing it is short of a lot of units, while it may have had some artillery and infantry and cavalry, it started to form things like engineers, medicals, veterinarians, signalers, ordnance corps, army service corps. And finally in 1904, a Canadian becomes the chief of the general staff, replacing the British. So by 1904, the Canadian military is now essentially a Canadian organization. So I'm going to stop talking about the Army for a while. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Navy. Our first sort of naval influence starts in 1866, when the Canadian Fisheries Protection Service was established. Those bloody Americans and Europeans were fishing in our zone, so we had a way of, had to have a way of protecting our fishing rights. But after the Boer War, the British tried to get our self, the self-governing dominions to help pay for the Royal Navy. In 2004, or 1904, uh, the Royal Navy withdraws its squadrons from Halifax and Esquimalt, as well as the British Army removed its garrisons from those two communities. The Royal Navy is now going into a naval race with the German Empire, which will help lead to the First World War. One consequence for us, of course, is that we have to increase the number of regular soldiers because we now have to man those garrisons in Esquimalt and Halifax. At the same time, the British are trying to pressure the Dominions to pay for dreadnoughts uh, as part of the Royal Navy. Winston Churchill is the Chancellor of the Exchequer at this time. He's trying to minimize ex expenditures of the Brit taxpayers and if you can pass some costs off to the Canadian taxpayer, the Australian, the New Zealand, by all means, try and do that. Australia and New Zealand do actually participate in this, and they have uh, dreadnoughts, and they, uh, HMS Australia. But Canada, of course, like a current government, is reluctant to spend money on the Navy. So the de debate in Canada comes down to a choice between two f options, either provide funds and support to the Royal Navy or form our own Navy. Well, after a lot of debate, we decide the second option, form our own Navy. So in May 1910, the Naval Service Act was passed, creating the Naval Service of Canada, which a year later becomes the Royal Canadian Navy. Our first two ships are two obsolete cruisers of the Royal Navy, mainly meant as training vessels. Um, there were plans for a larger force. However, the government changes in 1911, and nothing happens. No expansion of the Navy. During the First World War, the Navy doesn't play a major role in the First World War. They have a minor role. Many soldiers, many soldiers, many sailors join the Royal Navy instead. By 1922, the Navy has been reduced to 366 sailors and two obsolete destroyers on loan from the Royal Navy. It's not until 1931 that the Navy will get its first two destroyers custom built for the Royal Canadian Navy. By the start of the Second World War, the Navy actually has 11 ships, some destroyers and minesweepers. Let's jump to the 28th of June, 1914. The assassination of Franz Ferdinand of Austria, heir to the, th heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, who's assassinated in uh, yeah. Bosnia, Sarajevo. Pardon? Crazy well, we won't go to who. Anyway, after a July of everybody's on holidays, Britain declares war on Germany on August the 4th, 1914, when Germany invades Belgium. This automatically brought Canada and the rest of the British Empire, including all the, the self-governing dominions, automatically into the war. The Canadian government did have the freedom, however, to make some determination of, of our involvement in the war. 
At that time in uh, 1914, we had a regular army of just over 3,100 men because it's an all-male domain at that point in time. Although there was a plan for mobilization uh, of the armed forces, they were scrapped. And in terms favor of uh, mobilizing a completely new force, the Canadian Expeditionary Force, which was based on a number of battalions. The Minister of Militia and National Defense, Sam Hughes, was to train and recruit an army for overseas service. He encouraged the recruitment of volunteers and constructed a training camp in Valcartier, Quebec. The camp was very poorly organized. Uh, they ended up with about 33,000 recruits there. Training was very chaotic. Uh, little time to train the volunteers. Uh, inadequate tents, equipment, uh, confusion, etc. By October 1914, the troops were shipped to England, the 1st Canadian Division, where they had to go under significant training in some pretty uh, terrible weather conditions in, uh, in England that winter. Eventually, over 600,000 Canadians will serve in the uh, First World War. Up until almost the end of the war, the majority of those serving are British-born. By the end of the war, the number of those who were born in Canada has risen to 51%. So the majority of our soldiers who fight in the Second World War, or the First World War, even though they're part of the Canadian Expeditionary Force, were born outside uh, Canada. My two great uncles who were killed were both born in Britain, but were living in Canada and joined the Canadian military. Getting back to my friend Sam Hughes. Sam Hughes made a number of terrible decisions on equipment procurements for the force, insisting on the utilization of Canadian manufactured equipment, which was often, the, often inappropriate on the Western Front or of dubious quality. So that negatively impacted the operational performance of the Canadian Expeditionary Force. One of the better known examples is the Ross rifle, which troops were issued in Canada. An excellent sporting rifle, but um, often jammed in trench warfare conditions. They couldn't stand the mud and the dirt and the grime. So it's not until uh, November 1916 when Hughes is forced to resign that the Canadian Army becomes fully equipped with the British standard Lee Enfield rifle, which will serve them both in that war and basically through the Second World War. The management of spending for supplies was eventually taken away from Hughes and assigned to a, a war purchasing commission in 1915. Hughes made regular attempts to promote and appoint officers based on patronage and political activity and Canadian uh, native being Canadian born instead of ability. So that created a lot of tension and jealousy uh, within the military, within the army. Uh, the commander of the Canadian Expeditionary Force, who was still a British officer at this time, became so enforced, incensed rather, with his continued interference that he threatened to resign, which helps forces Hughes's resignation. The Canadian Expeditionary Force finally goes into action in March 1915 in the French town of Nouvelle-Chapelle. In the first week of April 1915, they're moved to reinforce the Yves Salient, which is a, uh, a, a concave bend in the British and Allied lines into the Germans. So on the 22nd of April, the Germans sought to eliminate this salient by using poison gas, the first opportunity where poison gas is used. Uh, following an intensive artillery bombardment, they released 160 tons of chlorine, gla ga chlorine gas from cylinders dug into the forward edge of their trenches. It left a four-mile gap in the Allied line. And particularly some French units broke as a result of that. The Canadian division was the only division that was capable of, that remained to hold the line. During that night, the Canadians fought to close the gap. Two days later, the Germans launched another poison gas attack, this time on the Canadians. In that time frame, those 48 hours of battle, the Canada suffered over 6,000 casualties, of which 3,000 died. So 6,000 casualties meant one in every three soldiers involved in that battle became casualties. 
The Canadian Corps was eventually formed in September 1915 with the arrival of another division, the 2nd Canadian Division in France. The 3rd Division arrives in December 1915 and the 4th Canadian Division in August 1916. <coughs> While the Corps is still under command of the British Expeditionary Force, there is con continued political pressure in Canada, especially after the Somme battles in 1916. The Battle of the Somme was launched on July 1st, 1916. The British Army suffers horrendous casualties. The new territorial armies are essentially, are, are, suffer immensely in that battle. <coughs> but after that time, there is pressure from Canada to have our Corps, our four divisions, fight as a, a single unit, rather than spread those divisions throughout the British Army. Something that the British Army was trying to do. They wanted our soldiers, but not necessarily our officers. But there was a battle to keep them together, and that essentially happens um, for the Battle of Vimy Ridge, which is the first occasion all divisions of the Canadian Expeditionary Force fight together. <coughs> so the Battle of Vimy Ridge takes place from the 9th to the 12th of April, 1917. It was part of the opening phase of a British-led battle called the Battle of Arras, which is a diversionary attack for a French offensive. The objective, and I'm sure all of you were probably inundated uh, not that long ago with the 100th anniversary celebrations in Vimy. So the objective of the Canadian Corps was to take control of the German-held high ground along the escarpment at the northernmost end of the Arras offensive. This would ensure the uh, southern flank could advance without suffering German enfilade fire. So supported by a creeping barrage, the Canadian Corps captured most of the ridge during the first day of the, t of the attack. The final objective of Fortified Knoll fell on the 12th of April. The success of the Canadian Corps in capturing the ridge was a mix mixture of tactical, technical and tactical innovation, meticulous planning, powerful artillery support, and extensive training. So this essentially sets the framework for the Canadian Corps for the rest of the First World War. Organization, planning, training, preparation. While we successfully captured uh, Vimy Ridge, the Battle of Arras, the larger battle, was not really a success. So while Canada is deemed very successful in, in the Battle of Vimy Ridge, the overall offensive is not. So while we celebrate Vimy, it in itself had very little impact on the successful conclusion of the war. The summer of 1917 sees the first time that a Canadian commands the Corps. General Sir Arthur Curry from Vancouver, who was formerly the commander of the 1st Canadian Division and was responsible for a lot of the technical innovation that occurred prior to the Battle of Vimy Ridge. He replaces Sir Julian Bing, who eventually becomes the Governor General of Canada. Uh, and he was able to actually reconcile the desire for national independence for the need for total, British, for total allied in integration in the Corps. He resisted pressure to replace all British officers in high-ranking positions, retaining those who were successful until they could be replaced by trained and experienced Canadians. British staff officers made up a considerable part of the Corps. By 1917, 12 of the, or seven of the 12 infantry brigades are commanded by Canadians. British regulars were in the staff, officers of the divisions, and British officers held two-thirds of senior appointments across the infantry, artillery, and corps headquarters, with only four of the most senior appointments going to the Canadians. And that reflects the fact that prior to the war, Canada had a very small regular army. It lacked the knowledge and experience and training of the staff officers, people to control the movement of vast numbers of men and equipment across the battlefield. While we recognize Vimy as perhaps, a lot of people think of Vimy as perhaps the most successful Canadian uh, contribution to the war, our actual most successful contribution is in the last hundred days of the war. So a series of attacks start on the 8th of April and continue on to the 11th of November. That is the most substantial role played by the Canadian Corps, the Hundred Days Campaign. April, or August the 8th sees the Battle of Immense, 
which the Germans call the Black Day for the German Army. We continued to fight for a total of 96 days through the Somme, the Scarp, Canal du Nord, Cambrai, and eventually end up in Mons in Belgium on the final day on uh, November the 11th, 2000, er, 1918. Those 96 days, we had 100,000 soldiers involved in four divisions. Our divisions are heavy divisions. The British Army, because of the shortage of manpower, had to reduce the size of their infantry battalions. Canada did not. We maintained large battalions. And one of the reasons they were so successful. But we engage and defeat or put to flight elements of 47 German divisions, uh, which represented one quarter of the, uh, of the German forces on the Western Front. That success came at a heavy cost. Canadians suffered 20% of their battle uh, casualties of the war during that period. Uh, during this offensive, the Canadian Corps experienced almost 46,000 casualties. Canadians, the Canadian Corps and the Australian Corps, because the Australians become very effective too, become known as the shock troops of the empire and take a leadership role in defeating the Germans. Total battle casualties uh, during the war, total fatal battle casualties during the war by the Canadian Corps were over 56,000. 13.5% of the soldiers who served in the Corps. Close to 61,000 Canadians died during the First World War because we fought not only as a Corps, we also fought in the air and other places. I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about Newfoundland. Of course, as you're all well aware, Newfoundland doesn't become part of Canada until 1949. So in 1914, it is also a self-governing dominion of the British Empire, just as is Canada and New Zealand and Australia. It raises a regiment of 100,000 soldiers, 100,000, 1,000 soldiers, who serve as part of the British Army. They never serve as with the Canadians. Uh, they always serve separately from the Canadians. They first see action in September 1915 on the Gallipoli Peninsula in Turkey. Withdrawn from there in 19, January 1916, they're reposted to the uh, Western front, front in March 1916. So the first day of the Battle of the Somme, July 1st, 1916, 18, 1916, um, they attack in a place called Beaumont Hamal. They suffer close to 90% casualties that day. Um, so July 1st is the 150th anniversary of Confederation. For Newfoundland, it's the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Beaumont Hamal. Since July 1st, 1917, in Newfoundland and Labrador, July 1st has been marked as Memorial Day. So uh, it takes precedence over the Canada Day celebrations, and I imagine it will particularly this year seeing it's the 100th anniversary of uh, Beaumont Hamel. You can't talk about Canadian participation in the First World War without mentioning the conscription crisis. After the Battle of the Somme, Canada, along with all the Allied armies, are desperately short of soldiers, particularly infantrymen, with very few volunteers to replace them. Uh, the recruiting effort in Quebec is less than successful. So Canada turns to conscription. Very unpopular in Quebec and in other parts of English Canada. Uh, the conscription crisis of, 18, of 1917 caused a considerable rift along ethnic lines between Anglophones and Francophones. The Military Service Act is uh, introduced in August 1917. After being passed, the government starts to conscript men across the country. Ultimately, just over 24,000 conscripts make it to France before November the 11th, 1918. But the conscription crisis comes back again in, in 1941, when the same problem exists in the Second World War. So what impact did the war have on British dealings with the self-governing dominions of the empire? In the spring of 1917, the Imperial War Cabinet is created with representation from the first time from the self-governing dominions. 
So Canada, along with Australia, New Zealand, and India, for that matter, sit on the Imperial uh, War Cabinet. It's uh, a recognition that the increased contribution by the Dominions to the war effort necessi necessitated increased consultation on the conduct of the war. The Imperial War Cabinet existed concurrently with Imperial Conferences or Imperial War Conferences, which were held in 1917 and 1918. So in April 1917, the conference passed Resolution 9, which resolved a conference be held after the war in order to rearrange Imperial constitutional arrangements, based upon a full recognition of the Dominions as autonomous members of an Imperial Commonwealth and should give the Dominions and India a right to adequate voice in foreign policy and in foreign relations. This apparently was the first time that the term Commonwealth was used officially. The Imperial War Conference also acknowledged the importance of the whole empire in defense policy by admitting India. India was not yet self-governing, but <coughs> was still a part of the British Empire, and, but at least they were to get involved in future conferences. In 1917, the Imperial War Conference also passed a resolution regarding a future special imperial conference to adjust the relations of the component parts of the empire. This adjustment would be based upon the full recognition of the dominions as autonomous nations of an imperial commonwealth with an adequate voice in foreign policy, whatever adequate voice may mean. The war, or the treaty ending the First World War, the Treaty of Versailles is signed in 1919. The terms of the treaty really impacted Canada very little in terms of uh, direct benefit. It did benefit, however, from an enhancement of our national status. At the peace conference, our Canadian Prime Minister, who at that time was Sir Robert Borden, insisted that Canada should have the same representation as Belgium and other small countries at the conference. In the end, Canada was given, along with other overseas dominions, representation on the British delegation to the conference, with seats at the conference. When the treaty is signed, Britain insisted that it be signed separately on behalf of Canada. Opposition to this proposal arose from the United States delegation, which felt that if Canada and the other British dominions signed separately, the British Empire would have six votes in the proposed League of Nations as opposed to just one. Eventually the problem was resolved by saying, having the British Empire delegation signed for Great Britain with representatives of the British dominions signed underneath the names of their respective countries being indented under that of the British Empire. Canada did, however, obtain separate representation in the League of Nations, so we did achieve that goal as well. Talk a little bit about the Air Force. During the Air Force, 20,000 Canadians served in the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal uh, Naval Air Service. In the spring of 1918, the Canadian government proposed forming a wing of eight squadrons for service with the Canadian Corps in France. Uh, the British Air Ministry said no, but we'll form two, a bomber and a fighter squadron. And on the 19th of September 1918, the Canadian government authorized the creation of the Canadian Air Force to take control of these two squadrons. However, in June 1919, the British government cut funding to the squadrons. So in February 1920, the Canadian Air Force was disbanded, never having flown any operations. Similarly, in September 1918, the Royal Canadian Naval Air Service was formed to help carry out any submarine operations. But again, it was discontinued after the armistice. In May 1919, the uh, Canadian government decided against a military air force because it felt none was needed. However, there was an Air Board. It's the Canada's first governing body for aviation, which exists from 1919 to 1923. One of its three th sections was a Canadian Air Force, which was a small, non-permanent air militia originally formed to provide refresher training to veterans. 1922 sees the formation of the Department of National Defense. We, it amalgamates the Department of Militia and Defense, the Department of Naval Services, and the Air Board with its Air Force branch. The Canadian Air Force became a new organization, and by 1923, when the reorganization was finalized, became responsible for all flying operations in Canada, including civil aviation, which was interesting at the time. 
1924, the Canadian Air Force becomes the Royal Canadian Air Force and continues responsibility for all Canadian flying operations, until including civil aviation, until 1927, when a civil aviation branch is completed. In the uh, 1930s, the Air Force, like the Army and the Navy, sees uh, budget cuts affecting personnel, airfields, pilot training, purchases, etc., etc. So by the end of the 1930s, the RCF is not a major military force, obsolete aircraft, and no real experience in military operations. I don't know how many of you have heard of the 1922 Chanak Affair in Turkey. Turkish forces were threatening British troops stationed in Britain after, or stationed in Turkey after the First World War. Britain asked for support from the Dominions. This was Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie's first major policy, major foreign policy test. And he declined to automatically provide Canadian military support to Britain. So another step of where we're separating our foreign policy from that of Britain. In 1926, the Belford Declaration is issued by the 1926 Imperial Conference of British Empire leaders in London, which declared the United Kingdom and the Dominions to be autonomous communities within the British Empire, equal in status, in no way subordinate to one another in any respect of their domestic or external affairs, though united by a common allegiance to the Crown and freely associated as members of the British Commonwealth of Nations. Finally, of course, in 1931, with the at the request and with the consent of the Dominions, the Statue of Westminster is passed, uh, further clarifying and cementing the Dominions' independence, legislative independence. Of course, in Canada, we don't implement necessarily all those things. Um, it is not until we get a constitution uh, repatriated in 1982. If we want changes to our constitution prior, prior to 1982, we still have to seek um, the British Amendment to the British North America Act. In some of our other powers, we didn't take them up immediately. It's not until 1949 that the Judicial C Committee of the Privy Council, a British body, ceased to be the final court of appeal for Canadians. So in March 1939, the permanent active militia has just over 4,100 soldiers. The non-permanent active militia, so the reserve force, has just over 51,000 soldiers. However, they're mostly armed with obsolete weapons from 1918. Uh, the Canadian Navy only has about just over 3,300 sailors, and the Air Force just over almost 3,200 so members. Limited equipment, limited supplies, obsolete equipment. So Canada goes to war again in 1939. So Britain declares war on Germany on September the 3rd, 1939. Canada is not automatically at war at this time. They don't go to war. We don't go to war until September the 10th, following approval by Parliament. Of course, Canada will play a very significant role both on the ground, at the, in the sea, and in the air during the Second World War. However, that is another story and not going to be touched on this morning. Thank you.